This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. In breaking news, leading scientists worldwide are conducting experiments to determine if Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. However, it appears the study was inconclusive, as the scientists couldn't help but eat all the Reese's. Because when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's. Find Reese's now at a store near you. When most people think of American food, items like burgers, hot dogs, and pizza come to mind. In fact, American cuisine is often negatively associated with mass production, high sugar content, and ingredients most people can't pronounce. David Shields, a foodie himself, felt this way for many years. Food was always an issue for me. I was raised actually in Japan, and my palate was formed in the 1950s from Japanese food. So when I came back to the United States in the late 50s, I hated American food. Someone fed me Kellogg's sugar frosted flakes and I thought I'd been poisoned. Shields is a food historian and professor at the University of South Carolina. He says that this mindset shifted as he dug deeper into the traditional meals and ingredients of various regions. It wasn't until I went to college down at William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, that I tasted Southern food for the first time. And there was a, a kind of integrity there that uh, struck me as being kind of analogous to Japanese food. He soon realized that it wasn't just the special dishes that made Southern food unique, but the ingredients themselves. Many of these items were heirloom crops or older varieties of fruits, vegetables, and grains unique to the region. And they all tasted different than their more modern counterparts. These crops had been cultivated for much longer than the ones in large-scale agriculture, and many were planted generations ago, during a time when food was grown on a much smaller scale. And flavor, not size or durability, was the most important trait. Modern agronomic breeding puts processability, disease resistance, pest resistance, transportability, quickness to maturation, all of these other sorts of things are elevated above it. As a result, the tastier heirloom varieties disappeared as mass production took over. In 2003, he was approached by a grain milling company that was interested in restoring older crop varieties. They gave him one task identify the specific ingredients that made Southern food special. He then spent three years combing through seed catalogs from agricultural journals of the early 1800s in search of these forgotten fruits, vegetables, and grains. 2006 comes along and I have a list of 45 ingredients that made up the sort of elemental southeastern coastal foodways. And uh, 41 of those were functionally extinct. He spent the next 13 years in search of these rare seeds, hoping to bring them out of extinction. Sometimes they could be found frozen in seed banks, which are essentially a library of seeds preserving the genetic diversity of plants. In some cases, the trail had gone cold and he was ready to throw in the towel. This was the case for the notoriously sweet fruit called the Bradford watermelon. I got an email. My name's Nat Bradford. I'm growing a patch of the Bradford watermelon in my place in Sumter. Turns out he's a seventh generation descendant of the originator of the watermelon. Thanks to his work, Shields has been aptly nicknamed the Flavor Saver and is now the chair of the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation a nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving historic grains, vegetables, and fruits of the Southeast. But what purpose do these older varieties serve other than being tasty novelties? Right now, people are really hungering, pun intended, for the past and the backstory of the cuisine. So there's intense curiosity getting away from this industrialized product that is out there, and people are trying to figure out, well, what are the various types of collard greens that were grown in what were the features, and can we get that taste of our grandparents back? That's Adrian Miller, a food writer also known as the Soul Food Scholar. He points out how certain regional varieties play an important role in cuisines. 
Take soul food, for instance, which is rooted in deep culture and tradition. Over time, soul food has become shorthand for all African-American cooking, but that's really not accurate. Soul food is the food that Black migrants took out of the South during the Great Migration that lasted over decades as millions of African-Americans left the South and started to live in other parts of the country. So this is the cuisine that they transplanted in other parts of the country. So soul food brings together the culinary techniques, ingredients, and traditions of West Africa, Western Europe, and the Americas. So some typical foods would be fried chicken, some kind of fish, usually fried chitlins or chitterlings, which are pig intestines, smothered pork chops as entrees. Then for side dishes, greens, so dark leafy vegetable greens like collards, kale, mustard, turnip, cabbage, black eyed peas, mac and cheese, candied sweet potatoes, cornbread, some kind of red drink. It just has to be the color red. I believe that red Kool-Aid is the official soul food drink. Not everybody agrees with me, but most people do. And then for dessert, pound cake, peach cobbler, banana pudding, sweet potato pie. Today, many African-American chefs and restaurateurs are finding unique ways to reclaim the origins of soul food, while also sometimes adding a modern twist on it. The most creativity and energy that I'm seeing these days is in the vegan category. So to a lot of people, vegan soul food is an oxymoron, but I don't think so. I, instead of a, being a departure from traditional soul food, I think it's a homecoming. Because if you look at what my West African ancestors were eating in West Africa, very plant-based diet. Of course, there are protein elements, but plant-based is very important. And if you look at what enslaved African-Americans ate on a daily basis, not on the weekends and special occasions, but just during the week, it's pretty much what we would call vegan today. If you're looking for these fruits, vegetables, grains, or other regional ingredients, Shields says the best places to look are local markets and even websites like Etsy. To find out more about Heirloom Foods, Soul Food, and our guests, David Shields and Adrian Miller, head to viewpointsradio.org. This segment was written by our associate producer, Tabor Brewster. Our executive producer is Amira Zaveri. Our studio production manager is Jason Dickey. I'm Marty Peterson. Coming up next week... In the industry sector, we're still going to continue to make those products. It's just how they're made that has to change. The production of goods and materials accounts for about 30% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Why is this number still so high? Then there's a risk that this election could end up being decided based on fake video or fake audio tapes. AI and its influence on elections. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. And that's Viewpoints for this week. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows. And find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.